presenting Mario and the Princess in bubble baths and shampoos. Our new shampoos are full of good clean bubbles for you. Super Mario Brothers Mario Shampoo, Super Mario Brothers Mario Bubble Bath. Our bubble baths are a real splash, too. We smell so fruity fresh. Super Mario Brothers Princess Shampoo, Super Mario Brothers Princess Bubble Bath. We'll turn your hair into beautiful bubble dews. Make it clean and shiny, too. A Nintendo, a choose a player. New Super Mario Brothers Mario and Princess Bubble Baths and Shampoos by a Revlon. <laughs> Welcome, dear listener, to our podcast, Jeff and Rick present Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Where we journey through each issue of the most underrated Marvel series of the 80s while drinking beer. Analyzing awesome and amazing adolescent adventures and absorbing alcohol. I am Jeff. And I am Rick. Mmm, but she randomed me with banter. Beep, bop, boop. She randomed me with banter. And failed me in biology. Random banter time, my buddy. Talk to me for a little bit. How you been? What new with you? Science! Science! <laughs> she blinded me with... Was sci- science! You are correct. And why would I have picked that one for this random banter intro? Because apparently there is science uh, taking place in this comic book. Yes, and that's what it is. It is science. It is pure grade A science. Grade A Marvel super muckety muck science. You better believe it. Uh, some people would use other terms to describe <laughs> the science, but we are a family friendly podcast, and so we will not use those terms. But I think you get what we mean. They also wore goggles and had they little visor things on because the experiment science thing was very bright. And also, there was biology involved in it because uh, Friday and Reed talked about biology or at some point. So, boom. My random banter, though, is going to be science-related because I'm going to show you I'm going to show you something <laughs> science-y. And, and I'm going to have to explain this out, but I got myself a package in the mail the other day, and it was one of those, like, what's this? What did I order? I can't remember, because I ordered it a long time ago, and it just came in. And I was very, very happy, and that would be because it's the Marvel Expanse, which is the Blackbird Jet Transformer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm holding it up right now, and it's all transformed in its robot glory. I love me the X-Men Blackbird. Always have. I saw that this thing was coming out. I was like, I'm going to buy this. I plopped down the big chunk of money for it, and then forgot about it. <laughs> Isn't it great being an adult where you're like, I shall purchase this thing, mm-hmm. and it shall complete me. And now I will forget about it entirely. And what's this thing that came in this pack in this package of the mail? Why is it addressed to me? Hey, honey, do you order something? No, I, didn't, I don't know what this is. <gasps> oh, I recall now. It's Joy in a and box. It's great. <laughs> yeah, it, the, the, the X-Men Blackbird <laughs> transforms into... A transformer, and this is an amalgamation of a lot of things, because it's kind of, it's blue with the yellow X cross, and and it's really reminiscent, especially with the goggles and the visor, of Cyclops, because it's blue Cyclops uniform, it's got the goggles and visor, and that's cool. But then it's also got these claws, these like... Triple claws, made out of pink psionic energy. Yeah, it looks like Psylocke, and, and, and on the other hand, they got the Psylocke blade. So we got Psylocke, uh, but the one of them's like the Wolverine claw. So you got like Psylocke and 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 Wolverine there. You know, you could also kind of say that there's a lot of steel, so you got a little bit of Colossus in that too. <laughs> it's just got a lot going for it, and it's really cool. I think it looks pretty sweet. <laughs> what do you what do you think? What do you think, man? When I first saw that it was coming out, it uh, it had my interest. I like X Men. I like action figures. I like uh, Transformers. Uh, so I was like, "Ooh, what's going on here? A Blackbird Transformer? That's really sweet." And then I, looking at it, I was like, "It's just a little too." Most of the crossover Transformer things, I'm always like, eh, "It doesn't quite do it for me." And although I approve of you getting that, and I think it's quite cool, it's not for me. Yeah, you know what? I I had a lot of like moments as I was pressing that buy button mm-hmm. where I was like. Do I really need this? Is this really good? Is this going to be really cheesy? Yeah, that all went away as soon as I started holding it. I was going, 
Nah, this is exactly the kind of cheese that I'm in for. My, this yeah, is my this in, is, my this instinct is, was to push that pre-order button as well, but yeah, I I, yeah. I it was just like, oh, gotta get the. Well, do I? Do I? Yeah, yeah. I, and you went do, and I went don't. So yeah, you gotta. I gotta say, you're gonna regret it. One day. <laughs> oh, oh, I regret so much, <laughs> so very much in my life. I regret. Now this is a place of honor. I I don't really know if it's ever going to transform black into the Blackbird Jet. I it's really cool looking. So uh, yeah, it's got a place of honor up on my toy shelves, which are I'm rapidly running out of room on. So <laughs> eh, eh. I also got Firestorm over there. So eh, eh. or I also got Firestar over there too. So eh, you know whatever. Anyways, that's what's bringing me joy in my life right now. What's bringing you joy, sir? Well, I'm excited to see your uh, Nova figure up there. Oh yes, yes, Fire, yes! I know for you. Firestar, Firestorm, Firestar, Firestar, Not Firestar, Fire, Firestar. <laughs> just fire, it's, fire, it's fire! Somebody wearing orange and red. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's that's cool for you. You got a new thing, and I don't want to brag or make anybody feel bad about themselves, but I actually got to watch some modern media recently. Ooh, yes. Andy Griffith, Andy Griffith show. Well, there's this little thing called Knight Rider, and it's about a smart car. No, uh, actually, I watched uh, Alice in Borderland. Ah, Netflix Japan uh, came out with this show called Alice in Borderland. It is eight episodes long, hour long each, and I don't want to tell you that it took over a month to watch it. And the very last episode took me five tries to get through all of it, where I'd get to watch it in seven minute increments from time to time, and then ended on a big strong suit of like you know, 17 minutes at a time to finish it off. But uh, yeah, that's my life. Yeah, it's just basically it's people in like, uh, I think Kyoto, just everything stops. It's really crowded. And then they get kind of transported into or don't get transported into like an empty city. And they're kind of there for a while trying to figure it out. But then it's like, oh, there's games that start. But this becomes very much kind of like a, is it a video game? How Saw-like is this? We're here. These are deadly games. What's going on? And so it's got a neat little mystery and a little kind of, you know, little video game feel. And also, you know, the there's the mystery. It's got action. It's got loss. It's got the suspense. I'm like, this is pretty darn cool. So Alice in Borderlands. I'd, Alice in Borderlands. Nice. Worth watching. I enjoyed it. Little little gory, little bloody, little uh, little feel bad, but neat. Well, that that's the same thing that happens when my new uh, transforming robot like beats up a My Little Pony. But I don't want to <laughs> brag about that either. I don't want to brag about that either. I think we just need to move along. Mm -hmm. Let's get to something pleasant. And the only way we can do that is if you give us a two-sentence replay of last episode. Let's just get this out of the way and say that Alex is a horse now. A horse man. Not a centaur, but a man horse. A space horse. He is a chimelion now for some reason, and that explains why he was losing his hair. Also, the now good puppet master lives downstairs from the powers, and his adopted son got a hold of one of his special radioactive clay figures of Franklin, which he used to fight his adolescent microwave shell-shocked amphibian action figures. Which means that when Franklin saw the turtle-esque snail aliens from Seagram 7 at a pizza joint eating za, they got into a punch-up and then Power Pack left their unconscious bodies in the sewers. Now that the Maggie also got all better, but then saw Alex as a horse and fainted, so who knows how that's going to work out for her. Two-sentence replay is over. Why don't you give me a beer and tell us what our Power Pack pick is? My pleasure, my friend. Now, in honor of this issue that we're about to read... I went off to the old beer store. I went and got ourselves a couple of cans of beer and put them into a nice paper sack and dropped one of them off at your doorstep. I'd like you to reach in and pull that out and tell me what you find. I was thinking you were going to say, I just brewed up a good wood grain moonshine so that way we could go blind. So <laughs> to be honest with you, I just kind of walked, started walking down a path that I didn't really know where I was going. That works. We got somewhere, and that somewhere is where beer lives. So let's see what's in the bag. Bum, bum, bum. Wild Ride Brew, Juicy Gorilla Snacks, India Pale Ale from Redmond, Oregon. Hmm. <laughs> oh, and there's a little uh, hat and coat wearing monkey man in the background in this uh, kind of... Oh, there's two of them wearing pink. Three of them wearing their backwards ball caps and being in this little kind of like banana plant forest. Hmm. Well, of course there's three of them. Yes, there would be three <laughs> of these monkey men. Hmm, Gorilla Snacks, what's going on? Oh, Wild Ride. This this series has been a wild ride. Hmm, juicy. Okay, yes, there's a <laughs> lot to sink into. Snacks. I could go for some. I haven't had dinner yet. Gorilla! 
is the tie-in theme because surprise surprise we've got great apes and i mean super apes with a uh, red ghost in this issue so i was really looking for a good red ghost beer but you know what I just decided not to go to Russia. There you anyway. go. My, my problem with Red Ghost is that I keep on thinking that his name is Red Mist, and that is an entirely different character. So. My problem with Red Ghost <laughs> is going to be talked about. Yeah. Anyways, um, <laughs> I've got Wild Rides, Juicy Gorilla Snacks, Indian Pale Ale. Take a walk into the wild with a ripe pint of Juicy Gorilla Snacks IPA. Brewed alongside George, our favorite gorilla, this juicy IPA packs a punch of tropical aromas created by the enormous amount of cryo citra and azaka hops in the beer. Add in strata, cashmere, and centennial hops, and you'll experience notes of passion fruit and citrus that will in your mouth. A beer you can beat your chest to and scream with joy as you enjoy this hoppy, juicy IPA. Oh! Beer, beer, beer in the jungle. We will drink you up. Watch out for that hop. Okay, Watch so out this for is those hops. <laughs> so that's so drink. This is alcohol, six point seven percent with fifty five IBUs. This is going to be a juicy, juicy little drinky. Uh, you can smell that Whoa. citrus. Yeah, it's almost a yeah grapefruity kind of hop. Mm hmm. But you got the hops in there too. Definitely smelling the hops. This is got the orange kind of color see-through on the glass so i mean it's it's very very it's not hazy it's just solid orange it's like orange juice yeah i'd agree that totally looks like orange juice when you hold it up to the light i i like the smell of this i do really like the smell of this yeah it smells nice uh like i like i was saying it very grapefruit-esque mm -hmm. in the nose on that just kind of like grapefruit and kind of micro hop nose on it yeah. Which does smell really pleasant. So let's see if the taste matches in on with the smell. I am getting that grapefruit hit. I am getting definite hops. Yeah. It's going to take us a while to get by the hops. Yeah. Second sip is going to be a little bit better for you. It's got a little bready kind of flavor in there, too. Kind of, well, at least texture mm -hmm. on the tongue for me. It has like a, you know, when you just take like a bite of white bread or something, yeah. it kind of has that feeling on my tongue. I'm not really getting that, but I'm getting a lot of the juicy, a lot of the grapefruit, a lot of that real punchy juice. It's strong. I am not getting the pine hit, but no. I'm definitely getting the the strong hops in there. Way on the tail of the back end of it, I'm getting kind of some pine. It's less pine and more like citrus seeds. Mm -hmm. You know how you like bite into an yep. orange or grapefruit or something like that? And then you'd be like, oh, I've got seeds in there. And you kind of have to like get the pulp and the juice out before you can get rid of the seeds. It has that seed flavoring to it. It's IPA in a weird citrusy way. Yeah. It's definitely juicy. Mm -hmm. I think they got that right. Mm -hmm. Put on your bathing suit because you're going to get wet after this is what it really boils down to. It, it promotes tongue drooling. <laughs> it really <laughs> does where it's like. Oh, I've swallowed my beverage. I need to swallow one or two more times just to not drown. So <laughs> come to our show, hear about us talking about our tongues. <laughs> our wet, wet tongues, because we're, <laughs> we're disturbing that way, really. We're disturbing. We're very disturbing. But I, I think that we've got our beers. We've got uh, our, our introduction done. We've got our random banter. We have avoided this long enough. Let's get into it. Opening credits, if you please, let's do this. Power Pack, issue number 61, January 1991, Ghost of a Chance. Credits, writer, Michael Higgins, penciler, Tom Morgan, letterer, Chris Eliopoulos, colorist, Nell Yamtov, editor, Mike Rockwitz, scout leader, Tom DeFalco, plot assist, Seth Crutchkow. Featuring Power Pack, Alex Power. He's a chameleon now. And he's got mass powers, I guess. Julie Power, light speed, she can fly. Jack Power, destroyer, he's got energy. Katie Power, she's got gravity. Guest starring, Jim Power, freaking out dad. Maggie Power, comatose mother. Reed Richards, bad dad. Sue Richards, out of patience mom. Raymond, a guy who has fire powers who may be Toro, you know, golden age hero. We'll get there. The Elon, a space alien. Friday, a chameleon smart ship. Hey, it's funny that you just mentioned Friday because she just crashed into the Powers apartment building. Wait, 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 what? How? Don't know. 
Apparently, an enormous burst of destructive energy hit them while they were coming out of hyperspace, and they crashed into the apartment building. The source of this energy burst is unknown. Ooh, a mystery. Don't get your hopes up. We never find out in this issue why, what, or who hit Friday. I guess it was just not important. I would personally disagree, but let's examine the damage, because there does seem to be a heck of a lot of it. You're not kidding, man. It is almost like a sperm whale dropped from the sky, and it smashed everything in this very specific portion of the building, including the bowl of petunias. And it even cracked the glass on a framed picture of the power kids. Are, are you sure those are the kids? They look different from the last issue. They look different from the kids in the issue before that as well. I'm pretty sure it's them, but speaking of them, where are the kids? And the kids' parents? And Franklin, for that matter. Well, they all crawl out of the destruction. Sort of. It looks like all the kids are okay. The parents are unconscious, as are the Elon and Raymond, who were on Friday, and Friday is toast. How did Friday turn into bread? Wow, you know how to take a turn of phrase, and keep turning it until it throws up all of your shoes, don't ya? Let's just go back to talking about the destruction of the apartment. Okay. Because of the structural instability of the remains of their apartment, and the fact that a number of people are trapped... Alex flexes his new Kequestrian powers and starts to put a protective force field up around the injured. Until a big piece of generic ceiling chunk falls down and clobbers him. Zoom! Franklin tries to warn Alex, but telling someone to look out while they are being smashed by debris just doesn't give them enough time to do anything about it. And with Alex down, the shield thingy he put up starts to weaken, endangering Julie and the parents. Luckily, Frank's got a new power set. He dream jumps into the young fool and hits the reset button on his brain and body. With Alex back up and able, it's aye aye, shields re-engaged, Captain. Then Franklin dream projects over to the real headliners of this series, the Fantastic Four. I would argue with you by waving 50 odd issues of this comic in your face, but then you would just show me the last couple of issues and I would lose that argument. It takes just a moment for the frightened Phantasm fledgling to fill in his fabulous family. Reed and Sue hop into their new hover rocket and head off to victory. They are not the first to arrive. In the Higgins Morgan first, trouble is quickly followed by gawkers, news reporters, EMTs, and then, eventually, superheroes. I think we should spend a moment on Reed's mansplaining to Sue how she should use her powers best to save lives. I would rather spend that moment talking about how Sue snaps back at Reed to stay in his lane and shut his mouth. She knows what she is doing, and she can think for herself. Touché. Touché. Sue quickly takes care of the debris and stabilizes the roof using her invisible shield. This allows Reed to assist with rescuing the powers and his son. Hey, good thing they sent him to live with a nice normal family whose home does not get destroyed on a monthly basis. Yeah, they sure missed the mark on that one. But there are three other characters in this rubble. The ones at the center of the disaster. Friday, Raymond, and the Elon. Raymond has made an initial diagnosis that, um, Friday is dead, Jim. The Elon begs to differ. The alien uses some alien mental power to find Friday's essence, which is contained in some kind of goober. The shell may be destroyed, but they have Friday's soul. And that's just as good. I guess. Well... With that out of the way, the pair scramble out of the wreck where the rest of the cast are standing by. Jack is excited to see the Elon, as the rest of us are, and gives him the nickname Marty the Martian, which is as good as name as any, I guess. And it only took like five issues for them to even think about addressing it. Now that the gang's all here, the superheroes fly off the building with the one broken apartment and back to the Fantastic Four headquarters. Wait, wait, wait a second. A spaceship just demolished a residential apartment building. The Fantastic Four show up, find the other heroes, and peace out? What about the rest of the building? The other people that live in there? The rescue efforts? With their powers and abilities, they could safely remove the debris and save lives. No time for that now. After all, it seems like the rest of the building is fine. Also, they already got the important people out, and there is science that needs to be scienced. But they're heroes. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like a, your opinion, man. Anyway, there are more important questions that Reed needs to solve. Like, why is Maggie broken? And how come Alex is a horse? And can a circuit with a soul die? Well, according to a bunch of sciencey machines, Reed has answers. Most of them are, I don't know, and fascinating. All of the problems you mentioned have their roots in Chimelian science. Sure would be nice if they could take this nice family and their broken spaceship back to Chimelia to get some answers. But 
The Fantastic Four just are not that kind of spacefaring, alien encountering galactic heroes. What are you talking about? In issue 28, they take a rocket and go smack around Maraud for kidnapping their son. They have the ability and the history of doing just that. You know that, and I know that, and I'm pretty sure the readers all know that. But Reed, and the creators of this comic, do not. So we are stuck here. With them. In this book. Well, Reed is focusing on Maggie and Alex's condition, since he doesn't have the time or energy to fly up to space. He's been given the lowdown on the chameleon's mind manipulation that put Maggie in this state. And while everyone is worried, Julie and Jack are having a really important discussion about how to get cool costumes like Alex. Yeah, Julie is insistent that by putting a note in their pockets, they can get snazzy new threads. Jack thinks that the people and elsewhere have better things to be doing with their time, though. What the chameleon blue sawdust? This is the argument they're having now? Now? Even though it has been well established that the people elsewhere in fact have nothing better to do with their time than to snazz up their costumes upon request? Reed agrees and kicks them out of the lab, which is the perfect opportunity for a pink and white mist to flow into the lab, looking for the remains of Friday. Ooh, the bad guy showed up on page 15. Hooray! While the mist plots stealing the tech, Reed makes his own breakthrough. He thinks he can reverse the brainwashing of Maggie, but he is afraid there could be some brain dysfunction as a side effect. Jim does not know if they should proceed, and Alex is getting all kinds of frustrated himself. Well, Reed's got good news for Alex as well. He thinks he has a way to turn Alex back into a real boy. He runs a test, but all it does is cause Alex pain, which is great if it were a torture device, but not so good for being a rehumanizing device. For some reason, Reed set Alex right next to the orb holding Friday. I guess the lab is a little crowded. Anyway, a frustrated Alex basically leans on the globe and hits it with his healing touch. This jumpstarts Friday, who is alive again and able to talk. Hooray! The literal Dos Ex Machina then pulls a Philo from UHF and proceeds to divulge the secrets of the universe to Reed. Or at least a primer on chameleon genetics. With this newfound knowledge, Reed quickly builds an annihilation device and destroys Earth. Nice pull, but wrong comic. He now has the knowledge of chameleon physiology to reverse the changes to Alex. With the formulas all typed into the computer thingy, Reed fist slams the start button. Do you think he built that button just to be started by hammer fisting it? It seems like an ineffective use of time to build that. Why not a switch or an enter key? Dramatic effect. And speaking of which... Check out the Dr. Frankenstein-esque effects as Alex starts to change. It looks painful, but Jim is there to give his son encouragement. Speaking of sons, Franklin walks into the lab at that moment, even though he and the other children have been banished to the not-this-room. Man, how many times do we have to go through this? If you do not want to be bothered in a room by your child, you have to lock the door. Come on, Reed, you should know this by now. The only room with a working lock is the bathroom. True that. But in this case, it is something else. Franklin pulls out a gas gun and blasts Reed in the face with it, knocking him out. Hooray! Jim tackles a young boy, but is surprised by this four-and-a-half-year-old strength. Then he is even more surprised when the young boy morphs into a baboon. Huh. And also appearing in the room is a gorilla and an orangutan. What? And also, also appearing in the room is the Red Ghost. Who? Oh, I'm sorry. I should have just said, and also appearing in the room is the Red Ghost and his super apes. Is this another classic FF villain? Another one? Yes, it is! From Fantastic Four, issue number 13, baby! A former Soviet scientist decided he wanted powers like the Fantastic Four people, so he designed his ship on the designs of Reed's and filled it with three apes, probably because Mr. Charisma here could not find three friends! Yeah, he's a bit of a jerk. He's got control over these three super apes, but he also has an intelligibility power like Shadowcat. The apes, Mikhailo, the gorilla, Igor, the baboon, and Piotr, the orangutan, all have their own powers. Michael becomes superhumanly strong and durable. Igor gained the ability to shapeshift and could transform into nearly anything. And Piotr gained the ability of magnetism. He's a monkey magneto if you would. Okay. A Soviet scientist and three apes walk into a bar. Actually, it's Jim that walks into Michaelo the gorilla who bars him with chucking him into the device that was dehorsifying Alex. Crash. This is why we cannot have nice things. Jim is out. Alex is in transitioning H.E. double hockey sticks land and calling for his dad from off panel while he is on panel. So I guess it's down to Sue to solve everything. Oh, yeah. 
She seems like the best and most logical person around. She grabs her head, waves her arm, and catches a couple of apes and a man-ape in a force field. Uh, too bad the ghost guy phases through and breaks her concentration. One of the apes reaches out and taps Sue's chin, sending her right into Nighty Nightland. Okay, I guess it's time for the special guest stars to take a stand. You mean Raymond and Marty the Martian? No, I mean Power Pack. They are the Fantastic Four's guest stars, right? If they are, it is news to them. They costume on by staring into a red sun for a panel before investigating the sounds of violence in the adjacent room. But they don't costume on into the spiffy new red and white ones like Alex has, so Julie must have lost that fight with Jack, or most likely forgotten about it immediately. They politely open the door to the lab and have a chat with the man and his primates. Julie gives a sit rep to the portion of the pack she is with that Dad and Reed are unconscious and Alex is gone, even though he appears to be still sitting in the shadows of where he was earlier when they left him. What about Sue? Like many things in this comic now, she is almost easily forgotten about. But the kids don't waste a moment because they start blasting the animal kingdom. And somewhere, Dr. Jane Goodall is crying. Jack blasts a baboon, Julie ribbons a gorilla, and Katie throws it into a wall. Slam! It is an all-out Donnybrook, which means that it is an all-out brawl. Meanwhile, in another room... Home of the rest of the characters in this book. Maggie is awake and having a nice chat with Raymond and Marty, the only two people in this building that she does not know. Her part of the conversation is mostly questions starting with W. What's all that noise? What is happening out there? Where is my husband? Where are my children? Where is my wallet? She is not well, folks, and we're all along for the ride. Raymond decides that staying with her will not get him the screen time that he so justly deserves, so he walks on down to find her and the readers a familiar face, leaving her with the Elan, which causes her to freak out, screaming, Help me! Somebody help me! That's okay. She won't be screaming it out for long because Marty uses some Elon power to make her fall asleep, thus ending their storyline in this issue. Raymond has found the action set and finally, finally decides to do something. He sees one of the apes tossing some metal at the kids and he blasts it with Human Torch level fire. Jack, taking a breath, powers up and unleashes a barrage back. But the big orangutan double fists the floor and traps all of the heroes under a cascade of collapsing roof. Oh no, the last page and the villain has trapped the heroes. Who is going to save everyone now? Why, James Tiberius Kirk Cameron Power, that's who? He has just appeared wearing another red and white chameleon suit exclaiming, You didn't count on me. James Tiberius Kirk Cameron Power? I don't know Jim's middle name. Next issue, Mr. Power and the End of Power Pack. We kid you not, be here. <laughs> kid joke, because, you know, Alex is still a horse. <laughs> you still have no idea what no, animal No, I really don't. I really don't. I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't. None, but none. I would like to talk about the themes of the issue with the Power Pack packaging time. <laughs> so we get out of that bit. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> We have ourselves another cover drawn by Tom Morgan. So hang on tight, folks. Hang on tight. Um, we have we have the Power Kids drawn in not drawn not very well. I, the, the kids are not drawn very well. We do recognize that it's the kids. We recognize that we've got Horse Alex down there who's wearing a blue and white costume, which should be red and white, but you know whatever. We got so close, so close. We got Franklin down there, and uh, he's looking. A little off there. We have Julie with blonde, blonde hair, which, I mean, yes, right now in current comics, she's got blonde hair, but she doesn't have blonde hair in this issue, so, okay. We have Jack, who is... Uh, a dwarf. He's a dwarf. And, and you know, we got we got Katie down there, and just, Katie just hasn't looked like herself for quite a while. There's this... Th these pink lines that are coming out, and there's this, like, swooshing up pink line coming up, and there's this... And the power pack symbol is all crumbled and cracked, and in the background we have uh, the Shadow King. Um, <laughs> yep. I, uh, honestly, I also thought it might have been uh, the Boogeyman. Yeah, it could have been Boogeyman. It's basically yep. we have grinning smile and these like you know, white eyes, which I 
Gas is supposed to be the red ghost. It's supposed to be the mysterious villain, and it's the red the, ghost. Yeah, the hint is going to be uh, the kind of pinky color to represent the the red ghost. <laughs> Fine, sure, uh, whatever. I was also thinking that this big shadowy form, you know, the big smile, like oh, that could be Juggernaut, but it's got a very hairy arm. So it's like, oh, okay. Once you read into it, you're like, oh, the the, the super apes. Oh, it's the it's Mikola, the the gorilla. Okay, but it's all power, right, whatever. Power, power pack destroyed. It says at the bottom, destroyed, and you know. I, 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 so here's something. As far as the book goes, as far as what's in here, Power Pack's down on the last page. So, yes, this this cover is well representing of that. It's the Power Pack versus something, and they get owned. Yep. But, I mean, I I would rather have said it said Fantastic Four featuring Power Pack. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, let's talk about that. Uh, sure. I would like to discuss this. Sure, please. Uh, I'm very tired of guests in a Fantastic Four comic that I'm reading, kind of seeming to try to be taking over the issue. I'm a little bit tired of the... I mean, okay, it's not excessive, but I'm tired of the amount of time that this Power Pack group is in my Fantastic Four comic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, there, I think there wasn't, there wasn't even any Ben Grimm. No, there was no. no Herbie. There was no. There was there was no uh, Johnny Storm. What's up with that? Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, it, it's Power Pack's got a lot of got a lot of screen time in here, but they're not at any point in time who you think the book is about. Fantastic Four and Come and Save the Day. It seems like Fantastic Four is the central point of who the, this comic's talking about. Yeah, and it's and it's really really strange. It's very strange. It's it's. What is happening here? And plus, we were also facing a Fantastic Four villain, too. So, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Let's mix it up a bit. Let's have some little new things that are happening here. I can see Power Pack facing up against the Red Ghost. Is he my favorite villain? No. I think he could be interesting. But if you're going to have them fight the Red Ghost, don't have it be on Fantastic Four property. This yeah. is Fantastic Four villain. <laughs> yeah. Because Fantastic Four takes care of him, and you're where Fantastic Four is, so you're yeah. superfluous. It's yeah. I have never liked Red Ghost or his super apes. I'm one of the people. I know that comics would stuff gorillas and things into their covers and <laughs> comics a lot because it sold issues. Sure, it really, really did. And this is a direct answer to that. And what's better than one ape? Three. Three. I I just I've never liked them. I've never cared for the whole ape motif popularity in things. Gorilla Grodd, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I don't need the rest. I don't need everybody to have like gorilla minions and stuff. Yeah. So I'm not a big fan of him either. I think that he's kind of, there, there's not much to him, especially as presented here. Mm. Also, this is just after 91, 92. And the Red Ghost and Communist Russia is one of those things that's like, wow, why are we bringing him in here? Because it's kind of not a growing concern right now anymore. You mm -hmm. know, we're, we're kind of out of that. Mm -hmm. Communism has fallen in Russia, so what are we doing here? What is this? Rebrand him, do something a little bit different with him, you know, change it up a bit. Have him being controlled by the gorillas. That would be fun. Uh -oh. <laughs> that could be fun. We're tired of your communist manifesto. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Proletariat what down. <laughs> yeah. What if it was the great apes, or the super apes, and the red ghost? <laughs> so no, I just... Yeah, it, it, it's very wonky. It's very weird, and I'm not. I'm not here for it either. I really am not. Let's talk about a couple other things. A couple other themes that we've got here. Now, we will find out next episode of what the deal is with the beam and why we've got Red Ghost here. It's not stated in this issue, but you know we do find out. Spoiler that it was the Red Ghost that caused the beam. Oh we man, got, we got things we can talk about with that next issue. I was excited to w to find out in two weeks what was going on, but now I already know. What's the even point? Yeah, I know. Here's life, the point. Life is horrible. I, it really <laughs> is. Here's the point. We could talk about the, once again, death and destruction of Friday, who apparently didn't die. So that's good. And the complete lack of concern by almost anybody other than Raymond going, huh, I feel like I've lost an old friend with Friday dying. Yeah, we don't have any kind of reaction from the kids. That's that's what makes us weird. The biggest thought balloons we really get are from Reed. You know, Reed's doing a lot of the thinking and a lot of the yeah. talking. The kids are just kind of like, they've got the guest actor's lines on the sitcom. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have the main lines at all. They don't have the conversation of, what happened to Friday? Oh, no, this is horrible. On top of what's happening with Alex, this is horrible. No, their lines are with, hey, let's get new costumes. Yeah. It, once again, it is the complete bizarre disconnect 
of the story at hand. Mm -hmm. And it was, once again, it was a thrown in argument between siblings to show, oh, siblings fight, and then to be immediately forgotten about. And especially this argument of like, if we put a note in our pocket, we can get new costumes. And Jack, no, we can't. That's not how this works. It's like, you literally know this is how it works. You have done it several times. You, Katie went on an entire adventure there and yeah. came back with that information. And that's how you got your costumes to fit right. And, and that's how you Im- got... important. Yeah, it's not important either. But it is literally just like, oh my goodness, our home just got destroyed. Friday just died. Alex is a horse. Mom is just... just catatonic. Oh, uh, you know what? I really want to talk about clothes. Yeah. You know, yeah, what? And, it, it's and, meaningless. And, and let's go ahead and let's go over to Reed Richard's house. And so he can do sciencey stuff. Folks, he's not a doctor. Your mom's in bad shape. Your not mom needs somebody. Yeah. You 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 guys need to go to Camellia, but you know, yeah. you were just in this horrible accident. How about getting checked out by an actual physician? Well, uh, keep in mind, for the most part, in the Marvel I Universe... Know, a, I know, A doctor is the excuse for everything. Yeah. A scientist is a doctor. It's just like in real life. Science, a, doctor, a doctor means you have a PhD in STEM. I get yeah. it. I get you have, it. Yeah, you have a PhD in everything. Is your satellite out? Is your heart broken? Is your mind not fine? Do your superpowers uh, wonky? Just go to the one doctor. There's only one person, and that's, and that's super astronaut... Dr. Peter Carbo. But beyond that, beyond that, (laughs) no, anyways, Franklin, here's a thought. Last episode, Franklin called his parents, right? Right. Called his parents. Hi, mom and dad. It's nice talking to you again. I just had this thought. Why didn't he just dream stuff from over there? Check in with them. I mean, you know, hi, mom, Mm -hmm. hi, dad, checking in with you. I could have called you, but you know what? This is better because I can see you. You can see me. You know, you can't touch me, but you know, we can have face to face. We can have Zoom time here. Yeah, they could. I thought about the. I saw you pause this, and I'm like, oh, that's a good question. And, and then I started thinking, it's like, here's why. His parents are very hesitant, reticent, disliking of him having powers. Unless. They, <laughs> yeah, unless they don't care. But it, it, the whole focus on that is Franklin having powers makes them very uncomfortable. I think he knows that, which is why, you know, throughout the previous irradiation of this comic, he wasn't telling them things. He wasn't saying, I have prophetic dreams. I don't this. You know, it like kind of came out in spits and spurts. So he, he's not going to, he instinctively knows he shouldn't just flaunt abilities to them because he knows that it makes them sad. So he's being a good kid and he's trying to not make his parents sad. And yet his parents use their powers around him all the time. So you know what? I know. Double it, standard. It, horrible, it is horrible, horrible, super horrible. double standard. It is frustrating family, as all get out That's to what me. their family is. The family is using the powers around each other and saying, look at what I can do. Look what I can do. I'm Ben Grimm. I I can eat, I yeah. can just destroy metal all the time. Hi, I'm Johnny Storm, and I can do fire tricks. Yeah. Hi, I'm Reed Richards, and I can use I can stretch and get things off a top yeah. shelf. And I I'm can. Sue, and I'm Sue <laughs> Richards, and I know how to cook. <laughs> I'm sorry, and that is not a dig. That's not me digging out Sue Richards. That's me digging out comic books, digging at Sue Richards. Yeah. Sue Richards is amazing. She oh, does Sue's um, awesome. fantastic things. Her power set is insane and awesome, and. Her best storylines are, what am I having for dinner tonight? <sighs> yeah. And even in here, we have Reed mansplaining to her. Yeah, exactly. I do like the fact that he, he, she kind of like stood around on she that. Does. It was just like, she does. I, I know my job. I know what to do. Don't you know tell what, me. Though? Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. Hey, Higgins, Michael Higgins, you know what you can do? Not write that joke. How about just write write read better and show that they're having a better communication that's that would be nice instead of writing something that shows that she has to stick up for herself why not just have them treat each other like humans and like competent teammates that yes, have that established have together over yeah. years and, you know and you could be having the thing in there it's just like instinctively they know what their roles are and what uh-huh. they need to do sue instinctively and automatically braces up the falling thing to make it so that Reed can reach in and pull out the people before the collapse. You know, this might be too much for, for Sue to do for long, but she knows that Reed has, has her back and will save the people that she can't directly save. Yeah, that would be much better. As a complete aside, but similar thing, I love the fact that modern comics are taking Sue seriously yeah. and talking about how it's just like, you know, people discuss and are like, yeah, you might think that Ben is the strongest Fantastic Four member or Johnny is or this but it's like it's sue Mm -hmm. you know and i like the fact that people are very much just like you know the power player in that group is sue and i i totally dig on that i love that 
Let's move into the other woman in the story. There are other females, but there's only one other woman, and that would be Maggie. Yep. And folks, poor, poor Maggie. Folks, I gotta tell you something. Uh, uh, the Louise Simonson stand-in is so far gone. This is this character has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with the original at all, and can't because it's just a shame of how they're treating her. Mm -hmm. they, they have reduced her to nearly being in a fridge, except nobody really cares. And they keep drawing her in more and more skimpy clothing that is continuously falling off. There is some very uncomfortable scenes at the beginning of this book where they're in the rubble and Julie's holding her mom and her mom is wearing a bathrobe and I'm pretty sure nothing else. Yeah. And it goes on and on. She's in the hospital bed and like the covers are barely covering her. And it's just like, a, what? why? There's no reason. There is no reason for it. She is a mother of four. And, and fine, like, I don't mind if they draw a mother of four looking beautiful. She can look beautiful all she wants. But we don't need to sexualize her in this comic. Yeah. We don't need it. And, it's, and it just is wrong. And it is, in fact, throughout. Like you were saying, it's like, you know, another consistency thing, a little minor thing here is her bathrobe changes from the beginning of the issue to the end of the issue. You know, it's like, okay, you, you change. But it, but it doesn't mean... If that, that, what that means is that hopefully, dear God, hopefully it was Sue Richards who, who changed her out of that into another, a, a cleaner bathrobe. Possibly, but it, it's still all cleavage. Uh, right. You know, the back <laughs> half of the thing is all cleavage. The front half is all lower body exploitation. And it, it literally, it, it's just like... It's it, it's sickening how it's just like it seems like they didn't know what to do with Maggie in this comic, mm -hmm. you know, at all. So they're just like, let's just shelve her. Let's do a plot point. Okay, her brain don't work now. Okay, great. But then just to be kind of like, yeah, it's just like the the physical exploitation of her. It's jarring and it really draws you out of whatever story they're trying to tell because it's just like this is kind of kind of sick. In how they're showing, yeah. Tom Morgan doesn't know how to draw kids. He knows how to draw superheroes, and he knows how to draw sexy ladies. So apparently, yes. that is what he is leaning on. And so his option for that was for a uh, comatose Maggie. Sure thing. So, yeah. It seems like maybe he was leaning into his strengths, which is not a thing to be doing no. in this issue. So, yeah. This ending... Of course, we got a cliffhanger ending with Jim Power, who last we saw was knocked out and unconscious, showing up in a chameleon costume, wearing some really high-tech future glasses. And he was wearing those earlier. He was wearing those goggles earlier because that was uh, when they were examining on Alex. They were, they were wearing those. It's they just, it just still, it's amazing that it fits so well with the with the costume and, and makes it look, you know, that much cooler. Uh, yeah. He is ripped. Yeah. Uh, he is ripped. He's been on the thin side, but he's always healthy looking. Yeah. This drawing team has shown him be just a beef monster. There was one, uh, an issue or two ago that I, I didn't bring up, but it was just like the kid. It was when Maggie's like, oh, Maggie's feeling better and all the kids except for Alex go and visit her. Uh, he's at the foot of the bed and I'm just like looking at the proportions of how he is and the size of a bed. I think he's over eight feet tall. Yeah. And just and it, when they show him, he's like in his suit coat jacket and stuff and he's just like bulging out of it in the arms and everything it's like that's not jim's body yeah uh jim has not been skipping leg or arm day and he's been focusing on the abs yeah tom morgan has drawn him <laughs> yeah. like a superhero he, he showed up to be part of the abtastic four yes 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 so yeah we have a i remember this as a kid i remember reading this and and i was so nonplussed i'm like whatever yeah, I don't. It, I don't get it. I don't understand what's happening, but I don't care. Mm -hmm. Don't. There's care. a lot of that. Yeah, it's the we'll get there. And it is funny. You were saying that you remember that you know from being a kid. It's just there are panels in like each of the books that we go through where I was just like, I don't remember any of the story. I remember that panel. I remember that one plot beat. I remember yeah. that panel. I remember that one beat. And it's funny where it's just like, oh, oh, I remember the one thing. So. Yeah, but yeah, it's very much. We're kind of at a stage now too with the with the comic where unfortunately we're like, oh, this is going on. Yeah, okay, cool, whatever, yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Fine. There's a lot of commentary we can read on this, but I decided to really dive into the power lines. It used to be the pick of the pack, but it was changed to power lines. Yeah, their letter, yep, their letter page. It's changed to power lines, which also seems to be the fan made. Yeah, the fanzine. Yeah, the fan, the fanzine was called Power Line, so the editor stole it from the fanzine. Nice guys. It's very interesting reading these letters because it looks like they were really trying to 
to get through to the good letters, and they were getting through a lot of hate mail. It just feels that way from the letters they chose and the letter, the, the, the kind of the hate mail that they kind of had in there a little bit too. It's also strange because throughout this, there's a lot of people that are kind of either questioning or trying to stand up for the creative team. And the editors that are responding back are trying to say, you know, just give them a chance. It's going to be get better. They're, they're finding their footing. You know, we glad, glad you liked some of the stuff they did. I know it's kind of hard for some people, but don't worry. They're getting better. Give them a little time. They keep saying that throughout the responses when on the previous page, they have the end of power pack. And they aren't kidding. Next issue is the end of this original run. That's it. Goodbye. We're done. The left hand and right hand aren't talking to each other. And it is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing seeing dysfunction at work of, of a, a letter column saying, hang in there. There's a lot more to come. Next issue. This is it, folks. Yeah. <laughs> and by a lot more, we mean maybe 28 pages or something of we a wrap up. Done. Yeah. I'd like to go ahead and move on to Creative Team Spotlight. <laughs> because uh, because this is done now. <laughs> this portion is done, Powerline. We move on now. I, I would like to... Uh, to do In something Soviet to Russia, we move on now. <laughs> I would like to talk about something positive, and that's the colorist. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Nell Yamtov was the colorist from issues 58 all the way up to the final episode. Final issue, 52. He was with Marvel Comics since the late 70s, and he has done a lot of stuff. He has been an, a colorist on a lot of work. He has done a little bit of writing here, a little bit of inking here. Not much to talk about. Not much to talk about at all. He is known just for being a colorist. And uh, G.I. Joe, Darkhawk, several Spider-Man issues. He has got stuff up and down the line, but... The big one that we need to talk to talk about is Transformers. He colored all 80 issues of the original Marvel US comic series and all of the miniseries. So he is the Transformer colorist. That's what he's known for. He had a very long run, very I mean 7 years in total. Uh, one of the most cr consistent creative forces in Transformers comics history. That's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It is very impressive. That's uh, something that is a a banner thing to put on your resume. All of his work has been called into question because of the quality of it. He has made many coloring errors, coloring characters the wrong way, making up entirely new color schemes for for characters he just didn't know, calling one character as another character, based upon pretender shells, secondary components. He's been criticized for laziness due to his fondness for coloring group scenes and backgrounds and block colors. And yeah, looking at this episode here... He does not have much in the way of doing backgrounds. Uh, backgrounds are mostly just block colors. There's no real detail in the backgrounds. So, yeah, that is one of his trademarks. He does not care for them. A lot of his supporters note that, you know, many of these techniques are perfectly valid artistic choices. Make the scenes easier to read, more interesting. But, you know, still, <laughs> you've got a long history what are you doing? Now, I, I am not a big Transformers. I like Transformers. I never really read the comics. But we've got some friends over on the Longbox Crusade who are covering all of the Transformers comics. So I decided to ask them their opinion. And boy, howdy. They also picked up on that. The famously and consistently bad, miscolored, inconsistently colored characters, washed out backgrounds, and occasionally not bothering to color all the panel. So we been saying that there's some real lack of consistency with the drawing and the inking and the coloring. I mean, there are some coloring errors that go on throughout the books as well. And all of that goes together. So, I mean, the lack of quality, the lack of consistency, it really shows. And I would like to say, you know, hey, we got somebody here who's got a real solid background, a real solid history of doing a lot of good stuff. But a lot of the complaints that we hear about him on his longest series are some of the complaints that we also see in this as well. It's not top shelf. It really isn't. And you can see that. The long run on Transformers, it was a beloved series that a lot of people liked. But I know it's got to be frustrating, especially with something like Transformers, where you have a lot of different robots. And, some, and Transformers are really hard to tell apart sometimes. They really are. And if you've got somebody that's messing up on the color scheme of robots... Okay, that's a problem. <laughs> Anyways, that's what I've got for Creative Quarter. We've got one more of these. We'll do next issue, and we'll talk about the editor, Mike Rockwitz. 
But until then, I think we'll talk about some Science Corner stuff. In this issue, the Red Ghost shows up on the scene with Pietor the Orangutan, Mikola the Gorilla, Igor the Baboon, and they're known as the Super Apes. But which are in fact members of the Great Apes? Now this got me thinking, what is a Great Ape? The Hominida, whose members are also known as the Great Apes or Hominids, are a taxonomic family of primates that include eight extant species in four different genera. These species are orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and modern humans. The great apes are tailless primates, with the smallest living species being the bonobo, and the largest being the eastern gorilla. In all great apes, the males are, on average, larger and stronger than the females, although the degree of sexual dimorphism varies greatly among species. Although most of the living species are predominantly quadrupedal, they are also able to use their hands for gathering food or nesting materials, and in some cases, for tool use. So there you have it, the Great Apes, which I think would be a pretty accurate team name for this group, but I think that the Red Ghost is a little too narcissistic to go for it. And that is this week's Science Corner. That, of course, is going to bring us to our Power Thoughts in Power Pack, we like to talk about the power thoughts. We like to take a bunch of artwork, put it up on our family refrigerator that has once again been destroyed. <laughs> that just means there's more room to put art up, I guess. So let's go ahead and talk about some funny, funny artwork. Jeff, would you like to kick us off in this wonderful issue? My joke backup is on page 26, and I call it Boys Bodies Bad. <laughs> and this is in the upper right-hand corner, and if you look at it, the boys' bodies are bad. Let's look at Jack. His legs deteriorate into minuscule feet and ankles. In the tiniest of tiniest feet, he would make a uh, geisha girl, like, a, <laughs> wow, I've got some clompers compared to this guy. And then if you look dead center in the middle, it's Franklin, beefy, muscular Franklin with his giant orangutan arms hilarious to me because it's like wow that is not how you draw humans and that is not how you draw Franklin. Franklin doesn't isn't four and a half years old with like adult arms that would drag on the floor so uh, that is my joke backup because the boys bodies are drawn bad. <laughs> how about you? Well What's they your thought backup? originally that they were going to be you know I, I think they originally drawn as the, the apes and then they're like oh wrong wrong Ooh. panel we got to like re mm. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> we'll just re-ink those <laughs> Well, I'm going to go to a couple, a few pages forward. I'm going to go to page 20. It's science. It's mad science. And <laughs> I got a good kick out of our mad scientists down there. <laughs> and we've got Reed and Jim goggles on. And there's this green light that's bathed in it. And, and Jim's yelling out, come on, boy, you're doing it. You're doing it. And it just looks ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. I totally see that. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I saw this and I'm like, it, they look like absolute mad scientists. It's just, it's a thing. It's a thing. It is a thing. What do you have for your top, <laughs> top funny one? Which one made you laugh with joy? My top joke one is on page eight and I call it Reed's doggy shadow puppetry needs some work. <laughs> <laughs> and this is in the upper right-hand panel, and in fact, his arm is extending down into the center panel, and it's him just, he has a hand, and he's got it in, like, the classic shadow of puppetry puppy dog kind of, uh, yep. kind of face, but he, he needs to pull, like, a finger back. He needs to, he needs to fix it just a little bit, and it would be a good shadow puppet, but it's, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, oh, you're making a shadow dog, but you need a little work there. Well, he can pull it off, because he's got the flexible body and stuff, so, oh, yeah. you know... Yeah, I don't know why he's wasting his time with that. I mean, he can do a full-on elephant, you know. Oh, exactly, We've seen that yeah. before. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to go ahead, and I'm calling this one out right now. And I know it's probably going to be in your top one, but my top funny one. Last page, last panel, muscled up Jim. That is nope. hilarious. Hilarious. Oh, no, it's funny. What do you call it? Muscled up Jim? Muscled up Jim. Muscled That's up Jim. That's a good name for it. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. That is that is not on any of my lists. Really, really, mm -hmm. I'm surprised. You don't know me. <laughs> I, I I don't. I really don't. I just, <laughs> I met you tonight before we started recording. Prior to this, I've just been using an AI. So you know, I, I, I a thing is it's a thing. It's a thing. It's ridiculous. It just it yeah. makes me laugh. And it's just one of those. Okay, what whatever. And and what, yeah, I can't put it on great because no, it's not. Yeah, it's drawn well. It's just 
ridiculous. Ridiculous. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to see something and just kind of go, nod your head and yeah. go, yeah, okay. Okay. All right. All right. Whatever. <laughs> what do you got for your backup best art? My backup best work is on page seven, and I call it Franklin's Fantastic Flight. And this is the bottom panel after he's dream selfed <laughs> over to go see uh, Mommy and Daddy and tell them that the powers need help. And so Reed and Sue are in the... The, what is it? The hover rocket flying over to the powers house. But yeah, so it's just dream self Franklin flying very, he's jacked as all get out. If you look at that, that left arm, he is ripply. It's very, but, uh, it's very Ang Lee though. It's like, you know, it, it's, it's Ang Lee, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Yeah. Franklin yeah, jumps. He's, he's, yeah. He's got the, the two finger kind of point, kind of like, I'm going here. I'm going to fly on top of that bamboo. Uh, I just thought, it, I thought it looked pretty cool. Okay. It's ridiculous, but also I kind of love it. You got them going. I got them coming back. So go to page 12, and I got the back end of that shot where they are running away from danger. <laughs> they are running away from danger. They have picked up the important people in this book, and they have decided, no, 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 no helping the other innocents. It's back to the FF headquarters with us. Yeah. But time it's, to go. Time to go. But they, they got, like, Reed and Sue in the front seat, the passed out parents in the back seat. You got Julie hauling all power pack on one side and you've got the elon who i guess can fly now i guess so yeah. i guess so uh hauling raymond back and i can't see franklin anywhere uh franklin is he's yep he's, he's uh sitting in, si in sitting the seat next to mom next to mom he's sitting next to mom yeah there you yep. go there you go run away run away run away <laughs> <laughs> they're a group that leaves a life of danger run away, behind run away. <laughs> We will run away from th scary strangers. Run away, run away, run away, run away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no time for helping, Dr. Jones. We are Dr. having Jones. fun. We are having fun. We are, I don't know what people are talking about. We're having ourselves a good old time. We are having fun. No, that's a nice little piece of art. All right, what do you have for your top, top? Best one. My top piece of art is on page six, and I call it Anthropomorphic Action Alex. And this is the top half of the page. You're more than half. It is after he's been uh, crushed by uh, roof debris, and Franklin jumped into him to jumpstart him up to be conscious and shielding things again. And uh, again, Alex makes a great looking Chimelian. Yeah. Uh, nope. The costume is on point. Alex is fit. He's got hair to die for. Uh, he's got it all going on. He looks great. The the artistic creative team on this book gets horse Alex right. Mm -hmm. We hate the concept, but he looks good. <laughs> I don't, yep, I, hate I, the I concept, can't. love the actualization of it. I think he looks wonderful. Yeah, I, I like that one. I like that one a lot. Now, you're going to hate this one, but I had to go with it because I thought it was a good picture, even though, once again, like the picture, hate the concept. <laughs> that's going to be on page 23, and that's called A Man and His Apes. Because <laughs> we got the red ghost looking... All kinds of anime action. Yep. As there's this, like, you know, lines coming out, and he's got the three apes there, and he's like, ah, and, and, and he is but one of the super apes of the Red Ghost in Russian. Yep. Um, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Man yep. and his apes. Yep. It was on my list. It's a good looking one. I'm not a huge fan of how they draw the apes, though, just especially the orangutan, because it's very kind of like hand wavy appearance, but I also kind of get that. So. <laughs> Really, it's it's all muddled. It's not great, yeah. but I mean, I I, I had to like, like it. it. I liked it. You like what you like, and I like what you've chosen. Thank so, you very much. Good job. I'm glad that you liked what I liked. What I think I think that what you liked was horrible because oh. it's rubber and glue moment. What's the best or most childish insult in this book? In this book, now what's being said between him and I? My backup is on that same page of page 23, and it is Red Ghost calling Jim a fool. <laughs> fool, your son means nothing to us, and neither do you. You are a fool. I like the classics. What can I say? No, that was a great one. This was on my list. Originally, this was going to be my, my Red Ghost quote. But, uh, yep, I, I then moved away from that one. But it's a good one. Mm -hmm. It's a really good one. My backup is on page 14. Julie and Jack are having an argument, and Julie tells Jack... Don't be a jerk, Jack. So it's just, don't be a jerk. It's simple. It's basic. It's just, don't be a jerk. Jerks and fools. Jerks and fools. Jerks and fools. Jerks, jerks and, fools. and fools. I am going to be pretty sure that we have the same top one. I would be surprised if we don't. Because is it on page 27? It's on page 27. And it, and it really just... Is it a red ghost? It's a red ghost. And it's really, <laughs> really good. And this is... The red ghost 
in the midst of the fight with Power Pack, do you really believe a bunch of runny-nosed brats will be able to clonk? Yes, runny-nosed nosed brats. brats. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Number one. Number one Top with a bullet. Rubber and glue. I'm sorry. Anytime, yep. anytime you start stringing together those insults like that, that's Chef's kiss to- choice choice. There's a little writer hint for you right there. You want to make an insult good on page? Just start putting words in there. The more the more commas or the more dashes you got in there, mm. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, that all being said, there is still the top and then there's the bottom. There's the stars, mm-hmm. there's the detentions. Who was the best and who was the worst of this issue? My friend, we are going to struggle to find ourselves a good one. And really, we're going to have to find ourselves a struggle to find the bad one because everybody is so milk toast. It yeah. was a real hard. I, uh, I I pick my star fairly easily, but uh, as always, we do the detention child yeah. first. And I kind I did in fact struggle with it because my notes for the detention kid, Julie? Question mark. Mm-hmm. I'll go. Julie is the worst kid. Yep. Yep, because she was arguing. Um, she was arguing with her brother about a costume. Yeah, exactly, a costume thing. Yeah, she got taken out by slow moving debris when she's a speedster. They all got um, taken out by sl- by slow moving <laughs> debris. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, she just it's just, everybody kind of yeah. didn't really do good. No. What was it? Something else at the beginning, I think. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's like Katie is holding up the debris of the falling apartment with her gravity powers. And and Julie's all, Katie, you need to degravitize me and mom. Do we you gotta degravitize parents so that I can fly them out of here? And I like the fact Katie's like, you know, is smart enough to be like, I can't do that. I'm holding the roof up. Yeah. Honestly, Julie could have been flying them out one at a time. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jul- uh, Katie, uh, you know, a much younger kid, half the age basically, has picked up heavier things. Than a mom and dad. It's, She's picked up a fifty gal- fifty five gallon drum in the middle of the ocean before and threw it at a fishing ship. It's so. just in nobody is them. Yeah, nobody's nobody's, nobody's, nobody's them. them. Nobody's I them. know. It's just calling Julie the detention kid is not a dig at her. Uh, somebody had to be, and it could have been anybody. You could have thrown any name in the hat, and it would have been. Here's fine. one thing I, I, in Julie's favor. Last issue, she looked horrible. She looked terrible. It looked mm. like she hadn't slept for days. Yeah. This issue, a spaceship crashed on their building and she looks as fresh as daisy she looks young. she looks better yeah she looks yeah young. she doesn't anyway. she, she's well they, they've drawn her with very cut angular facial features <laughs> they've now they've drawn her completely different anyways <laughs> yeah she uh, her her intro photo uh intro piece of art is she again she looks like an adult she looks like she's a, a wayfish 23 year old or something yeah it's yeah yeah so so we got we got franklin as the best yeah, Franklin. Oh, yeah. Hi, Franklin. Yeah, that, he, me too. He, he remembered. He's he remembered. He's got parents. Yes, and he jump started Alex. Yes, well, that's about it. That's about it. That's about it. But yeah. Oh, he also oh, 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 uh, he, he also, shot his dad. He also in the face shot with his dad in the face was good. Yes, I was going to say. And so, <laughs> man, that's right. You just go. You know, you stand up to your dad. You say, "Dad, you are a bad dad. Oh. You need to stop winning the <laughs> worst parent of the year award." Eh. Who cares? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll give it to him. I'll give it to him. Okay, but you think that Julie was the, the, the Ju- worst Julie kid was too, the worst. Right? Franklin yeah. was the best. We're we're yeah. we're in lockstep on that one. Let's move on to let's 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 move on to top grades. Let's move on to top exactly. grades. Yeah. It, we're milk toast on both our choices. Pretty Who much, cares, pretty so. much. We evaluate each issue gets the rest. Top of the list, still power pack number forty two, Revenge of the Boogeyman. Ten down from that, Boogeyman must die. Ten down from that. We've got Power Pack number 22, Trapped. 10 down from that, we're at spot number 30, Power Pack 14, School Days. That's when Boogeyman kidnaps Katie. Down from that, Power Pack number 40, Crackdown. Alex burns down a crack house in order to destroy all the drugs. Good for him. (laughs) Good for him. (laughs) Number 50, we've got Power Pack 28, The Breakfast Club. Remember when we thought the the Breakfast Club, where they break into the entrance mansion, we thought that wasn't a very good issue? Mm, I still what? enjoy that guess one. Guess what? <laughs> Let's keep on going down. Yeah. Number, tick, s- tick, tick, number tick, 60, tick. Thor, Volume 1, 363. Thor and Beta Ray use Katie as a weapon. Hmm. Not, not good, but still better than everything below. Because at the bottom mm-hmm. list, Acts of Vengeance. Acts of Vengeance is fine. Acts of Vengeance is not losing its place of honor at the bottom of this book. But we are not going to go too far up. Issue prior to this. Back to school, where Alex turns into a horse and some snails TMT thingies fight. That is on spot 66. Better or worse than last issue? Hmm. 
You know, I was just going to go, was going to talk about Shelter from the Storm, where it's the inappropriate sexual exploitation of a female character. Ooh. Uh, where, Ooh. Which is, because this both has it with uh, you know. Dagger on that one and Maggie in this one in just kind of inappropriate uh, hospital garb and wear. Here's the thing. I like the mm-hmm. art from Shelter from the Storm better than this. Yeah. I do. Mm-hmm. And even though that's a funky story, this one... This one, it, actually, they, they share a lot in common. We were really trying to figure out who the main story, main people in that story were, because I guess it was Cloak and Dagger. It wasn't Power it's, Pack. Tangentially, it was much more... Uh, the the, the uh, kids, yeah. Mar- yeah, Marguerite and... can't remember yeah, his name. The, yeah, the, the two runaways. I, yeah, yeah. I've got to say that, that that probably is still better than this one, because... This one, Power Packs here, their name's on the cover, but this is a Fantastic Four book, so... Yeah. Hmm. <sighs> then, of course, we have our ongoing debate about X-Factor Annual Number 2. Art is still better in that. The storyline's more clear in that. <sighs> is it? Yeah, it is. Is it? It is. I don't know about that. I would uh, still pers- I'd put this above the X-Factor Annual, mm. in my own personal opinion. Mm, fine, I... Because they disagree. had some pretty muddy storyline stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, yeah, uh, yeah, I almost disagree. Uh, but I'll, I'll give it to you this time. We'll make this the new sixty-eight in between Shelter from the Storm and Man in the Moon. Still say Man in the Moon is too low, but I would argue you with that immensely, and we'll continue to. <laughs> and we will uh, continue let's, to. Let's just agree uh, when you're at the. Some of the you know, some lists where you go just because it's at the bottom doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that other stuff was better. Let's just acknowledge that it, it's in the bottom of the list somewhere. It's not great. <laughs> yeah, right pretty now. much, pretty much. You're right though. The, the the treatment of women women in this issue is worse than Shelter from the Storm bad, and that is saying something. Yeah, yeah. This is still not as bad as Jinx and the Armor though. <sighs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about our beer. Thank you. Thank you, beer. We have Wild Ride Juicy Gorilla Snacks by Indian Pale Ale. I'm still enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. It's still juicy. still grapefruity. Yep, still um, grapefruity. It's got a lot more of that bitterness taste. The bitter the bitter yes. notes really kick in near the end. Yep. If you like hops, if you like that bitter, here you go. Yeah, it's not tarting my mouth up. It's not puckering my face, yeah. but it is. I am... Drinking it, uh, I go, oh, citrusy. And my tongue juices out, and then my tongue shrivels in just a little bit on itself <laughs> from that from that bitterness of the hops. So it's it's fine. What do you think about it? I'm thinking that it's fine, too. I think that it's... Uh, I've had better... I like where this is coming from. I like the overall taste. Once again, not an IPA fan. I'm going to go ahead and probably say it's about a 3.5. Mm-hmm. I'm in, I'm in the same... Yeah, I'm on the same train as you. Yeah, I was like, I'm enjoying this, but I'm not enjoying enjoying this but i would totally i would I, i'm gonna keep drinking it i'm not arguing with it i'm not like oh look my my cup is so full and i don't want to go back to it it's not a dumper beer it's a i would drink this again yeah i would too i'd happily drink it again wild ride's got some good stuff it's definitely juicy it's it's a very juicy beer no it's 3.5 i think we're called good with that yep moving on there we go and now that we're moving on from that we move right into the kids perspective and that's where rick asks his now 10 year old daughter carrie about the issue we just covered and hmm i'm gonna guess that they absolutely loved it together and she thought it was the best in the world but i have been wrong before so rick and carrie take it away hello carrie Hello, Daddy! Are you ready to talk about a comic book? Sure. All right. So we are reading Power Pack 61, right? Right. Tell me your feelings. Tell me your thoughts. Grumble. (laughs) (laughs) Why do you say grumble? Well, it's just... I don't know. Something's just... It's just part of that same... The same little series of bad things in this big series. Okay, let's talk about some of the bad things. What are the things that you really had problems with? I don't know. Franklin looks a little old and in this in the one picture where he's like showing his mom and dad where they where the power pack children are. Yeah. It looks a teensy bit like he's a grown up. And yeah. and he's like he's like, Ooh, look at me, I'm super cool and I'm here to rescue you. <laughs> but he's like really like a four year old. <laughs> yeah, the um the drawings are very they aren't 
really consistent, are they? Not really. And how do they match up with the last issue? They look different, right? Yeah. And this, this is a pretty much the same creative team. It's the same artist. There's a different inker that's on it, and that could account for some of it, but it's, it's not consistent at all, is it? No. Let's talk about how the, the issue started to start it off. What happened at the very beginning? Friday crashed into the fire park building. That was unexpected, wasn't it? Yeah. And bad things are happening. Everybody's trying to save everybody else, and they have to get Fantastic Four to help out. And then the Fantastic Four get involved. And all of this has something to do with the Red Ghost and his apes. What did you think about the Red Ghost and his apes? Bad guys? <laughs> <laughs> Did you like them as bad guys? Well, they did appear in the middle of the book. I don't feel like I know them that 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 well. So yeah, you've got no experience with these characters before. You don't know who they are. You don't know what their deal is. Well, I do know that the Red Ghost's name is Red Ghost. And he's got three apes that work with him, right? Three strong apes. Three super apes. Do you care about them at all? The strong one seems important. <laughs> What about Power Pack in this? Do you think Power Pack's got enough time in this book, or do you think that this is... I feel like, while well, they do appear a few times, it just doesn't feel like it's setting completely on them. Yeah, it's not focusing on Power Pack at all, is it? I don't really know exactly what it is focusing on. Do you think it's more focused on Fantastic Four? Maybe, but otherwise we have what, all these scenes of them like... Of them doing stuff. Not impressed with the art. Not impressed with the bad guy. Not impressed with the story, right? No. Is there anything you like in this? I don't know. <laughs> what do you think about Alex uh, Reed trying to change Alex back into human? That was weird because first uh, Mr. Power was like, you got to stop him. You're hurting him. Then we see him like, oh, yeah, you're doing it. Keep going. <laughs> so even the plot points are a little inconsistent. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the ending. Yep. What do you think about the ending? <laughs> what do you think is happening? Jim Power got mixed into Alex's body? Huh. That's an interesting theory. Well, it looks kind of like it happened, and he was the one who was thrown against the controls, so... That could be an interesting theory. Okay, so Jim Power somehow got mixed together with Alex's power, right? Maybe he can turn into a cloud. <laughs> Are you happy to see Jim Power looking like a superhero or not? Well, at least he um, looks heroic. <laughs> <laughs> because he's got big muscles? Yeah. <laughs> we always we found it interesting because the letters column, it talk, keep, they keep talking about how... This book, this creative team, you know, give them a chance. They're going to be here for a while. What's the last thing you see on that page underneath Jim Power? Next, Mr. Power and the end of Power Pack. We kid you not, be here. So next issue is the end, the end of the series, right? <laughs> Are you ready for the end of the series? Is it really the end of the series? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> it's the last book in this series. But then there's a couple of follow-up books. And then, and then, Louis Simonson and June Brinkman come back. Phew. For one issue. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, phew. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, we'll be back with that one, okay? Do you have anything else you want to talk about? Um, no. All right. I love you, honey. Love you, too. Oh, I was wrong again. Man, I just got to come to... Grips with the fact that Carrie might not be enjoying these anymore. <laughs> no, not so much. But let's go ahead and shout out all of our listeners that take the time to write in or leave us a review. This is for episode number 76, Power Pack 58, Starstruck. Al Sedano and Resurrections, and Adam Warlock and Thanos podcast. Charles Gears, who says, I think this is the issue where I started my letter writing dragging this creative team into the deep dirt. I do not regret the wasted time and effort. We don't either. Chris Lighton. Doug O'Loughlin and his store, Comic Cave in Portland, Oregon. Ed209, who says, It took a long time to figure it out that the dapperly dressed man was Thomas Raymond, a.k.a. Toro, the original Human Torch's sidekick. Green Lantern HG. Hal Jordan. Jeremy Daw. Joey Burdick. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. 
<laughs> you always have to go. It's a show on that one. You it's just have contractually to. contractually obligated. Yep, it's true. It's a part of the social contract. The Long Box Crusade with Jason Weasel Skull Albright. Matthew Birdsey. Max Trevor. Sean and the Secret Wars and Beyond podcast. Waffles from Waffles and Mario Talk About Things. And we're going to go ahead and keep on thanking our Patreon supporters. And so, awesome and amazing Andrew Burns. Cheerfully charming Char Logan. Challenging, chuckling Charles Gears. Daringly destructive Damian Witter. Dangerous, devious Doug Jones. Exciting, entertaining Edward Verrochi. Jovial, jumping Jeff Pullier. Magical, mighty Matthew Birdsey. Mythical, mystical Matthew Lazarus. Rustic, running Rustin Fritcher. Superior, smiling sailor Bear Zodar. Sad, silly Shag Matthews. Stupendously strange Stephen Gray. Tyrannically typical Tim Price. Terrifically triumphant Todd Enoch. Wonderfully wacky wind. Be sure to check out our other shows that we're on. We sometimes show up on Junior Agent Submissions of Honor Majesty's Secret Podcast on the MI6 Rogue Agents episodes. Also, I've got this great movie podcast called Monthly Monday Movie Muckabout on the Longbox Crusade and on its own feed now. Find me at Monthly Monday Movie Muckabout. Keep in mind, great is subjective. Mm. And we have some merchandise available on Redbubble. Go to redbubble.com and search for Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Jeff Emmerich presents his bi-weekly self-produced podcast recorded in front of a live studio audience of one transformed X-Men toy in Portland, Oregon. If you would like to interact with us through the magic of the internet, you can do so through Twitter at Jeff Emmerich Presents, our Facebook page, Jeff Emmerich Presents, our email address, Jeff Emmerich Presents, all one word at gmail.com, or to our website, Jeff Emmerich Presents.wordpress.com. Also, our YouTube channel is at Jeff Emmerich Present. And if you would like to help support our show, we are on Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com, Jeff and Rick present, all one word. We are also a proud supporter of the Hero Initiative, and we will be donating 10% of our Patreon donations to this great cause. We encourage everyone to give what they can to this worthwhile organization that helps the creators who provide us with such great content. Go to heroinitiative.org to find out more. Please rate and review us wherever you can. Tell your friends about us or share your love for us on social media. And as always, we want to thank the powerful people in our packs. My wife, Cindy, and our daughter, Carrie. My fiance, Hillary, and our daughter, Aurora. We, we love, love you. you. Until next time. Costumes, Costumes off. off. Our theme music is 80s action. Also featured in this episode is Rainbows. All music is by Kevin McLeod on Decompetech.com and is licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 License. He dream jumps into the young fowl. Fool. Yeah. Crash. Which is connected. Which is contained in... Which is then. Which is then... Con no, actually, it was in there already. <clears throat> okay. It was already there. It was a... Yeah, the little doohickey inside a glass sphere, and... Who cares? I care as much as the people who created this issue did. Crash. Ooh. The bad guy showed up on page 15. Hooray. That really sounded like a foghorn. That was... <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. I'm like, that's a foghorn. Crash. And somewhere, Dr. Jane Goodall is crying. I really liked putting that in there. I, I, that was, that. <laughs> Crash! Now, this got me thinking. What is a grape ape? The, I'm gonna die. What is a grape oh. ape? You said did grape. Did I say grape? Yeah. Oh, of course I did. <laughs> Crash! And we have some merchandise available. <laughs> you can cut that part. You know I like it. And... Hey, Expanse is going to get me. X going to give it to you. You going to give it to you. X going to give it to you. You going to give it to you. First you're going to transform. Then you're going to go, did I break it? Then you're going to go, <laughs> yeah. where's this part go? 